Guide to Politics. I am Liz Philippos, and I'm here to offer an expanded perspective into this moment in our collective political lives so that we come to a deeper awareness of our capacity to transform and transcend the present paradigm as agents of transformation. Each week, I talk with creative leaders about their spiritual understanding of the current political moment the possibilities for the well-being of our planetary lives and the life of the planet itself. They inspire us to know that the personal is political and the political is spiritual. There are tremendous possibilities for transformation when we really come to know this. My guest today is Laylee Mapayan. She is currently the executive director of the Wellesley Centers for Women, which is a leading organization committed to research and action programs for the well-being of women and girls. She is a professor at Wellesley and has a background in psychology, African-American studies, women's gender, and sexuality studies. And she's written about identity, world religions, hip-hop culture, mothering as social transformation, and the genius of grassroots women around the world. Laylee is most known for her groundbreaking work on womanist theory, which is a spiritualized, holistic, global approach to equality, justice, dignity, and community. What I like about Laylee is that she offers us a practical application of spirituality. It's an embodied spirituality that is about living the goodness of spiritual teachings. She offers us tremendous openings for social, political, and spiritual transformation so that we might live in peaceable, ecologically sound, and self-actualizing ways. And actually, her whole theory is based on the idea that we self-actualize and become the agents and leaders of transformation. Welcome, Laylee. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Liz. I'm really glad to be here. In your work, you've talked quite a bit about spiritual activism, and you have a unique perspective on what that is. Spiritual activism is something I started talking about probably 17 years ago, 18 years ago now, when I first heard Anna Louise Keating talking about it in a lecture. And I thought, this encompasses exactly what I've been thinking about and trying to talk about, but didn't have the exact right language for. And, you know, there's this idea that for everything that we do that manifests in the material world, there's some visible or metaphysical substrate to it. And there's an idea that you can influence the material world by taking these metaphysical principles and the contents of the invisible universe into account when you are doing political or activist work. It's always relevant. It's always important to take a step back and look at political issues and political questions and concerns and think about What's really behind what we see? What kind of energies are influencing outcomes, are influencing people's actions and moods? And really just start asking those kinds of questions, even if we sometimes have to ask them quietly to ourselves instead of out loud. It's important as a spiritual activist to be looking at any political situation as one in which the job is to transform the energy from something that's negative to something that's more positive, to something that's conflictual, to something that's more peaceful, from something that's life-taking to something that's life-giving. So I think being a spiritual activist is being aware of those energy dynamics and being willing to step in and try to change them so that other things can be rerouted. So I know that's a pretty generic kind of intro about spiritual activism, but I thought I should set the stage because I find that often when I bring it up, not everybody even knows what we're talking about. It's a great explanation that you offer. Talking about, you know, metaphysical principles or the invisible, can you say a bit more about that? 
Sure. Think about love. None of us can see love, but we all know when we feel it. We all know when people are experiencing it. We all know the power that it has to make us feel like supernatural beings when we're filled with love. And that's a very accessible kind of understanding about the invisible world and the fact that it exists. Like, you know, if you if you have a hard time believing it, just think about all the things that you already deal with, thoughts and feelings. A lot of these principles have to do with transforming energy from a low vibrating state into a higher vibrating state. So, for example, right now, I find that a lot of people are really drained by the negative news all around them. You know, the news feels like it's filled with negativity because the imagery that's being hoisted at us and the words that we're often hearing almost seem like they can't get more negative day by day. We have to realize that if we passively receive those words and images, we're going to take on those energies and our own vibration, if you will, is going to go down. It's going to become more negative. It's going to become more sapping of our life force. But if we use the spirit within and we consciously choose to receive that energy differently, almost in a Tai Chi kind of way where we bring it and we send it back out or we replace it with something stronger and more positive, then we first gear ourselves up to be more fortified so that those energies can't just come and sap us. But then we also build ourselves up to the point where we can put a surplus of good and strong energy back out into the world for other people, whether it's in our families, in our workplaces, when we're walking down the street, in our places of commerce, wherever we go online. It's like when a person walks into a room with a smile or laughter, they turn that room around. We have that same kind of power in very serious situations, whether we're dealing with the governmental kind of context, whether we're dealing with gender-based issues that have been in the news lately, whether we're talking about environmental issues, whether we're talking about racism. You know, there's just, there's no field of change in which this self-fortification, building up a surplus of energy to get back out, isn't uh, important. So what you're saying is that we can have control or dominion over how we receive what's happening around us. We don't have to receive it just as it is delivered, that we need to be aware of the impact that those negative energies have on us if our desire is to be agents of transformation. Yes, so that, that is. But ground zero of that is recognizing our own power to be active rather than passive. These kinds of negative forces really gain energy the more passive we are, the less we analyze what's happening, the less we take charge of the energy. Step one is recognizing that we can be active rather than passive. And then step two is fortifying ourselves to turn those energies around and receive them differently. I mean, a good example would be in terms of how women are socialized. There are all kinds of forces all around us to try to influence women to believe that we are somehow secondary, inferior, that we should be quiet, that we should behave, that we should, you know, there's all these kind of messages that come. And I think about, as a developmental psychologist, about young girls growing up and receiving these messages and how they're scaffolded by the people around them to recognize that they have power over those messages. They have a much better time feeling good about themselves, staying strong and confident as they grow up. And then as they become adults, they gain the ability to do that for themselves, you know. So sometimes it does take people outside us reminding me of our power to receive or not receive messages and to kind of transform the energy. And it, it, the process certainly goes better when it's scaffolded by other people. But at some point, we have to internalize, you know, the ultimate power is within ourselves and to use that as a political force for good. Absolutely. I think uh, it's a very empowering way to even begin to know that we have the ability to make change, and we don't have to wait for someone else to do it for us. We don't have to be mad at others also. Right. Yeah, it's true. And we also have to realize our own ability to mobilize outside of the social institutions that we've been told govern our lives. So, for example, you know, I I feel sometimes that there's a notion in certain threads of activism that, you know, we have to get the government to do something because if the government doesn't do it, the thing can't happen. From a spiritual activist perspective, I might say, well, let's obsolesce that whole energy, go somewhere else, start doing something differently and attract people to that other way of doing things a remembrance of our existential freedom. And I'm not saying that in a way that suggests that social forces have no impact or that we can just easily 
thrive against all these really inimical forces in the world that are undermining people's well-being. I'm not saying that, you know, poverty and homelessness and violence and these things can just magically be turned around. But I am saying that we can influence the calculus of how those things play out and that to some extent we have a responsibility so, so long as we are able to use our ability to command energy to turn those things around and to help others to do that. Is spiritual activism is that capacity to transform energy. It's the transformation of energy itself. Right. And it's understanding that everything is built on energy. I mean, everything that we do institutionally, everything that we do politically is built on some kind of energy substrate. It's built on a thought. It's built on a feeling. The laws that we pass are based on feelings that we have and thoughts that we have, whether it's beliefs, attitudes. You have to change the blueprint to get a different outcome. So we we sometimes try to change the outcome without changing the blueprint. Mm -hmm. You know, so, for example, we can go get a law changed, but if we don't change how people think and feel about things, then we don't really bring that law into effect, (laughs) at least not as easily and sustainably as it would otherwise. So I've done research in the past on how school desegregation played out legally in the United States and otherwise. And, you know, we know that just because we had Brown versus Board of Education didn't mean everybody was magically happy to integrate schools. Mm -hmm. You know, there was other kinds of work that had to be done on the level of attitudes, on the level of beliefs, on the level of kinds of emotions that people had around racial difference. That's work we're still doing today. But unless we first accept that that's part of the work, and then agree to do that work, and then move forward with that work, even if everybody's not with us, operating on the belief that as we build momentum, more and more people will come over to that side, then we are fighting an uphill battle, because trying to get people to conform to a law based on an abstract ideal in the absence of feeling like that's what they want to do is just very strained. Mm -hmm. There's a cultural shift that has to happen, and, and an education at a very basic level especially media, because media is a fount of energy because of the images and words that it throws out, and often in ways that affect people very subliminally. And there are things that happen in the brain as a result of how we encounter things in the media. There's a lot of energy transactions that go on around media, even more so now with social media. And we have to be aware of the kind of choices we're making with media, not just with the media we consume, and how it affects us, but with the media we tolerate in our society. If we say that, oh, anything goes in the media, then that's a recipe for some of the worst things to really take over. So we have to view content of the media as part of our spiritual activist strategy. And I don't mean that in a censorship kind of way per se, but with a real consciousness about, and maybe a research-backed consciousness about how different forms of media influence people's perceptions, actions, feelings. I mean, we know it's true with stereotypes. We know it's true with predisposing people to certain behaviors. I know there was some research done many, many years ago that showed that, you know, people that watched violent TV had more of a hostile world idea. I mean, that's not rocket science, Mm -hmm. but it shows that there is a relationship between what we consume. I mean, we have to think of our media consumption the same way we think of our nutritional consumption through food and water. So we want clean water, we want healthy food. We need to think the same way about the energies that come into us through the media because they are feeding our brains and our ideas and our spirits and our energies in the same way that food feeds the body. You've done really wonderful work on womanism as both a theory and praxis of social transformation. And I would love to hear you talk about womanism a little bit for our listeners and to just how do we see this current climate through a womanist lens. What is that offering us right now? We'll talk about, you know, how I first fell in love with womanism. It was because I detected in it, and this would have been in my early readings of Alice Walker's womanist definition and In Search of Our Mother's Gardens, just soaking in the tenor without overly analyzing it. I detected something that was both spiritually sensitive and something that was also gentle in spirit, yet very vibrant and very transformative. And I fell in love with that as a practice. It was something that I felt like I needed to publicize as a spirit of being in the world and doing work, a way of being in the world, a way of being on a path of doing work in a certain kind of way. I felt its contrast with the way I was experiencing feminism at the time. 
my experience was that feminism was more self-consciously adversarialness as strategy. Womanism felt much more of a, let's figure out how to build family. Let's figure out how to build community. And it also felt like a perspective that used caretaking to heal and make change, used nurturance. And you could call nurturance femininity or not, you know, because I think that people of any gender can be nurturant. I felt like this caretaking thing was really the essential part. My observation is that in the world, so many people, and not just people, but also plants and animals and the earth, are really in pain in a certain kind of way. There's a great deal of suffering in the world right now. A lot of that suffering is caused by either people's needs not being met, their basic needs for life and vitality not being met, or by things being grossly out of balance. You know, I've always approached the work from kind of an ecological perspective or an ecological understanding about the world, understanding it as having a human element, as having a nature element, as having a spiritual element, and that all of these are interpenetrated and that they all have to be in balance. And if they're not in balance, things go awry. Things have been awry for so long, both at the societal level, also in the environmental context, also in individual life, you know, psychically, things have been so out of balance. The weight of suffering in the world is so great. And the only way to move things back in another direction, besides the kind of energy transformation I talked about, was to work harder to get people's basic needs met. I mean, you know, you can't expect things to go well in the world if people don't have enough food, if they don't have clean water, if they can't basically feel comfortable in their bodies day to day. They can't grow up in contexts that allow their minds to flourish because their basic physical substrate is in place, you know, where they don't have safety and housing and where their human relationships aren't reasonably safe. Those kinds of things are the foundational things that make everything else go well. It just requires the basic nurturance that historically has been socialized into feminine-bodied persons and, and socialized into women's roles in the world, but anyone can embrace the kind of nurturance that womanists talk about. In fact, I think womanists would argue that we need to counterbalance some of the deprivation and competitiveness in the world with this more nurturant spirit to help people get their basics need met. And then once they get that, the next thing is to help people move into a place of self-expression and self-actualization so that people are actually contributing the best of themselves back to the larger collective. You know, that's what got me excited about womanism, and that's why I still think it's extremely relevant today. It's easy to write it off because when you say, you know, to solve world problems, a lot of people's basic needs to be met, it sounds too simple. It sounds too boring to a lot of people, but to me, it's really the key. Well, and if part of politics is about collective decision-making around how we distribute rewards and benefits in society, then that's Mm -hmm. pretty key to a political life. You mentioned caring, nurturing as an aspect of womanism and talk a bit more about the energy of mothering. Mothering and mothering as social transformation. Yes. You know, I once characterized mothering as love plus leadership. Nurturance isn't just this giving spirit and this acts of physical caretaking or emotional caretaking, but mothering is also this leadership of developing beings into their developing selves, into their highest and best selves. It, it, you know, it, it has this kind of energy of seeing the best in people and being able to bring it out in them over time, having trust, basic trust in who they are and in their goodness and knowing how to bring that out by leading people through their lives. But there's also some very specific ideas that come out of, at the very least, African cultural context. You know, I think, for example, of the work of Chikwenye um, Okonjo Ogonyemi, who talks about community mothers and talks about mother of the market and all these mother of the nation. You know, there's, there's these kinds of mothering roles that go far beyond one's biological children. To be a mother leader in increasingly large social context. So it is sort of an alternative political leadership kind of concept, but only if you expand the notion of mothering beyond the way we usually think of it. Mm -hmm. That's such an important point that it is about leadership and Mm -hmm. seeing the best in people, bringing out the best in people. 
Right. And also, I think there's an element to mothering to be able to look into a group of diverse people and figure out how to make the system of caretaking and the system of nurturance work for all of those people at the same time. So there's a very dynamic kind of consciousness that goes with mothering that's always figuring out what's needed now, who has what to offer, who needs something and who doesn't have something, and how can I be the engineer of helping all of us get that. There is that dynamic systems analyzing quality that mothers also bring to any kind of situation, whether it's the situation of the family or the situation of the nation. And I think that if we had a more womanist concept of leadership, we would also demand different things of our government. When we have debates about economics, you know, we're always talking about, you know, subjects like education and jobs, you know, just in terms of people getting wages and having money. But we don't talk about it in terms of the nurturance of people's talents and skill sets and how important it is to people psychologically to have a livelihood that, you know, capitalizes on your talent and helps you to contribute that back to the collective. We don't talk about the psychological health and then the social health that comes from having that in place. It's just all about, oh, do people have enough jobs to get enough money to buy enough goods to create, you know, GDP in the nation or whatever? It's more than that. There's a spiritual dimension is what it does for the psyche. How are we nurturing that psyche? And I really believe that when you nurture the psyche, everything else follows. You know, so we have this very deprived, this very thin kind of model of what makes society work. But womanism offers a very rich model of what makes it work. It's simple, but it's rich. Mm -hmm. So from a womanist perspective, politics are always a spiritual matter? I think life is a spiritual matter. Every aspect of life has spiritual dimensions, and politics is no exception. The issue happens is that we sometimes take a very materialistic approach that doesn't take the spiritual and psychic and moral dimension into consideration. Part of the reason that we feel like we're in the middle of a political collapse, because even though we somehow have developed this discourse that we're better off without those aspects, I think actually the opposite is true. The issue always has been that there are people or systems that tend to use power to harm people with whatever you put forth. So, for example, let's say that religion has dogmatic aspects, it has metaphysical aspects, it has social aspects. For those who are oriented towards social control, we're going to hone in on those aspects of religion that allow them to control people and exploit people. But that doesn't mean that the content of religion can't also offer us moral wisdom, social wisdom, metaphysical information that we also need to make things better. So when we say, oh, we can't teach religion because we can't afford to allow one group to use religion to exploit and oppress others, then we're also throwing the baby out with the bathwater because we're not tuning into the content that religions have, particularly when we take them all together, to offer society important information and principles to make us live in more life-affirming ways. And I use that word religion broadly in my book. I use the word life system. Um, Sometimes I also talk about wisdom traditions and philosophies and spiritual tradition. The language I use is broad, but throughout its history, humanity has evolved systems of thought about the invisible world, about the metaphysical laws of the universe, about moral principles and human virtues, about ways to cultivate good society, notions of justice. All of those things are ideas that the more we think about them, the more we know about them, the more we talk about them, the more effectively we can execute them and the more likely we are to integrate them into our individual and collective life. So to me, we're opposite, we're operating now from this kind of deficit perspective that says don't touch it. It's dangerous. It has harmed us before and doesn't make room for the perspective that there's incredibly valuable information here and that if we had more of it, we'd have more to work with. Mm-hmm. I think that womanism, A, acknowledges that the spiritual realm exists and is real. Womanism just takes as axiomatic that the spiritual world exists and is relevant to everything about everyday life. There's also this understanding that because we're all spiritual beings, I talk about everyone having innate divinity, this kind of kernel of of light or reflecting the divine that we're all born with. Now, what we do in the course of our life may differ, but, you know, we all have that kernel, um, at least when we, we come into this world. The idea is that because that is there, developmentally, we're going to have part of us that wants to grow that part of us. If you put spiritual water on people, If it's actually the nourishing kind of spiritual water, it's going to make them grow. It's going to make them develop into wonderful beings. It's going to help people actualize. Womanism opens up people 
making or finding their own spiritual path. It has a lot of room for people exploring religions and spiritual traditions, for crafting their own way. I mean, so many of the original authors of womanism were religious women. Many of them were black Christian women. Some of them were, in the case of Alice Walker, kind of multi-religious or pagan. And there were African traditional and African-derived religions. There was Islam. And, you know, there are a number of different religious traditions that have actively fed into womanist thought. But the idea that many womanists and like-minded people have brought up is that we benefit most when we meander through our own spiritual paths and we explore and then we create a spiritual understanding and identity for ourselves from many different sources. So womanism really authorizes that or endorses that. Womanism really says that's a good thing to do. There are some religious traditions in which that would be viewed as a very challenging or very problematic kind of approach. But I think it's very consistent with what's being offered to us in the modern world because we now have access to so much information about multiple spiritual paths that would have been very hard to get in past eras. It's very easy for us to learn about other traditions now than the ones we were raised in. If we start the quest, we can perpetuate it, we can find community, we can build community, and womanism very much encourages those things. Mm-hmm. On your mind today... What's most pressing? What do we need to know or do? The biggest thing we need to do right now might sound very broad. I once heard a a saying attributed to Buddha that it's never been a more important time than now to be awake or to awaken. There are so many forces trying to shut down our consciousness and make us unaware of why things are playing out the worst. So keeping ourselves awake and helping others to be awake, I think, is a really big task. But I think if you ask me the other kinds of things I'm thinking about, I'm, I'm always very interested in basic things like food and water, what's happening in agriculture, what's happening in, in water around the world, how's the ecosystem going to be able to support life and where do we need to look to see where it's threatened and make sure that we have a future. I also think a lot about education. You know, obviously I work in higher education, so that's always on my mind. But I think broadly about education. Is education making it possible for us to thrive or is it making it less likely that we're going to thrive? And how are we creating our educational systems? What are we doing to make it possible for people to build better society? For example, one of the things I'm really concerned about right now is the sense that the kinds of employment that the current economy makes possible are not well matched to the educational experiences that people have, at least not in the United States. And there are a lot of people who are coming out of school without an ability to have a livelihood or without having had opportunities to find a way in the reality of the current world economic system. That's a big concern to me, too, because all these things boil down to the basics of life. Mm -hmm. Any last thoughts you want to offer people who are listening, who are thinking about spiritual activism or womanism? You know, besides looking at books, what else would you tell somebody who's interested? Well, you know, one of the, the things that I love most about the womanist perspective and that I like to remind people, particularly people who are activists, is the importance of self-care. It's so easy to throw yourself into the work to the point where you're exhausted and you're burnt out and you don't have anything left and you feel crazy. That doesn't get the world anywhere. The importance of self-care is something that I like to remind people of. It's just an acknowledgement that it's okay to think about that and it's okay to take care of ourselves and then to support others in doing the same. Sometimes that requires slowing down. Sometimes that requires tuning into our spiritual practices. Sometimes that allows us just having fun or engaging in social relationships for recreation, the kind of things that sometimes the hardest working activists forget to do. But it's not just activists who need that. I mean, it's just people who are taking care of people all over the world, the mothers. It's the people who are struggling through jobs that don't pay enough and housing situations that are troubling and difficulties with their kids or their elders. or You know, I mean, it's just all kinds of situations. So many things that burn us out right now. Not letting ourselves get eaten alive is really important. And then in terms of the spiritual activism side, I would say don't let anybody talk you out of the reality of the spiritual substrate to life. It's there. And just like we didn't know germs existed before they got discovered, it's there whether we acknowledge it or not. So, you know, the quicker we discover it, I think the better off everybody's going to be. The quicker we make it a universal understanding so that we can then collectively work with it, I think will be the greatest breakthrough for humankind that we've had in a really long time. Hmm. 
Mm, beautiful. Well, I thank you so much for the inspiration. You're a breath of fresh air. Oh, thank you. You've been listening to Professor Laylee Mapayan talk about spiritual activism. You can learn more about Laylee at the Wellesley Centers for Women website at wcwonline.org. You can also get Laylee's books, The Womanist Reader and The Womanist Idea. Thank you for listening today to A Spiritual Guide to Politics. I am Liz Philippos. 